Welcome back to Module 2. This video is going to be talking about life on Earth in the context of our solar system overview. We will have a longer discussion of life on Earth in the context of astrobiology at the end of the semester. So for now we're just focusing on two sections out of Chapter 8 in OpenStax Astronomy 2e. So when we think about what determines the habitability of a planet, there's a lot that goes into it. I'm going to slim down our discussion for this chapter and this lecture section uh, to three main things that makes Earth a place where we humans and all the different biodiversity can live. We have a protective magnetic field, and I'll show that on the next slide. There's liquid water on the surface, which our biochemistry needs, and that fact is actually two separate pieces of information. We have a lot of the molecule, H2O, for water, and we have temperatures on our surface that are neither too cold so that it's all ice, nor too hot that it's all steam. And then finally, the big thing that we're going to focus on in this video is that we have free oxygen in our atmosphere, and that will be a bigger topic that we also discuss way at the end of the semester in Chapter 30. So Earth's magnetic field is this protective blanket around us. It can't protect us from big space rocks, um, but it can protect us from charged particles. Now, we're not going to get into all of the details of what these charged particles are in this section. It's not a key part of our curriculum. But the magnetic field of the Earth blocks the solar wind, which is this constant outflow coming from the sun. It's part of what we'll learn is called space weather. Uh, and it also protects us from charged particles that are sourced outside of the solar system, like cosmic rays, which are just very fast moving protons, so a charged particle that the uh, magnetic field can reroute and, and save us from uh, the majority of them. So we can think of it like a protective blanket around us. It extends about five Earths forward in the direction of the sun. And because of the solar wind, the tail is much longer um, and it can extend all the way out to the moon uh, on the opposite side of the sun. All right, so what else did we talk about was part of um, Earth's habitability? The uh, water on its surface. Now we think of Earth's lakes and oceans as plentiful, uh, we often call it a blue marble or a pale blue dot, uh, and it's the, most, it's the most abundant thing we see if we look at a map of the globe of the Earth itself. But if we were to take all of that water and just kind of compress it into a little sphere, uh, we get a remarkably small amount of overall water. Our planet is just a rocky planet with a very thin layer of water on its surface. When we look at all of the um, fresh water available to us, it is a very small amount. The um, overall water in the oceans is, is bigger. It's that marble that takes up about half of the um, United States across, uh, but that's not drinkable water. When we think about the water that we use in our everyday lives, it is a much smaller overall source for all of the living things on the surface of the earth. And then the last thing we talked about as being a key factor for life here on earth is the oxygen in its atmosphere. Now I actually want to talk a little bit about um, two big properties of Earth's atmosphere. The oxygen that we breathe, that we think of when we <gasps> breathe in, is O2. So two different oxygen atoms combined to make a molecule of oxygen. That is very easily reactive with lots of different things, and the only reason that we're constantly able to breathe it in is because there are sources on Earth's surface, uh, both bacterial, algae, um, and then the plants that we think of, trees and shrubs, um, that are making O2 molecules through the process of photosynthesis. And our discussion of life on Earth and the history of the planet um, in Chapter 30 will expand on that. But it's also true that oxygen atoms can create a, um, three of them together, can create a molecule called ozone. And we may have heard of the ozone layer, uh, and we're going to be talking about that on the next slide as well. That ozone layer can protect us from a lot of the high energy light that the sun produces. The kind of light that um, gives us sunburn, the ozone helps to minimize that impact. And then the other big property of Earth's atmosphere that doesn't necessarily make it more livable for us is um, greenhouse gases and the increasing amount of greenhouse gases. 
And it's really a big part of what I want to make sure you are aware of as you go off into the world and become a citizen and um, a potential um, source of policy change and activism um, that I want to make sure that you're aware of in this, in this section. So humans have altered and continue to alter the Earth's atmosphere in a lot of different ways, but there are two stories that I want us to focus on. One is a story that gives us a framework for what can happen with, um, with enough voices. So we, uh, as human beings, have destroyed the ozone um, in a way that has taken decades to try to recover from by creating technologies that used a particular molecule that we didn't realize the long-term impacts of. Chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, you don't have to write that in your notes, um, are just really good at breaking up ozone molecules and really good at not breaking themselves up, so they stick around for a long time. Aerosols and different refrigerants have used CFCs, uh, and there was a whole bunch of different scientific evidence to show that the ozone was being negatively affected. It was being depleted. We were having an ozone hole over Antarctica. And all of that scientific evidence got brought to um, the world's governments. And in 1987, they signed the Montreal Protocol, limiting significantly all of the different uses of CFCs. The world phased out a lot of these technologies, replaced them with different things, and the situation is continuing to improve. This is a story that has, um, in in its effect, shown us that policy can change things for the better. The ozone hole will get back to where it was before we had these technologies by maybe 2040 or so. So it's still a long way to go, but we are seeing improvement. Now, greenhouse gases is the story that we are currently part of, and it's a longer story with more scientific evidence, but less scientific policy making it to the government level. So carbon dioxide and other molecules like methane can trap heat uh, very well. So we get sunlight from the, um, from the sun. We get light from the sun and that warms the Earth's surface and then the Earth's surface radiates that back out as heat. Uh, and these greenhouse gases keep that heat in the same way that a greenhouse can grow tropical flowers uh, even in wintertime by keeping the heat in. There is more evidence for the damage that is being caused as part of climate change because of the technologies that we use that add carbon to the atmosphere, but there is a not, not enough policy change yet. So it is really essential for us as humans in a society to understand what this process is and recognize what we are doing and how we can change it. So in this diagram, um, there are a whole bunch of arrows, and I want you to stick with me here. Um, they are showing where uh, different types of energy come from. So on the far left, we have two big arrows um, that are showing us energy from the sun, making it to Earth's surface. And some of it gets radiated back out as heat. Heat is the curvy lines. Now, those clouds are acting as this protective blanket, trapping a lot of that heat in. Some of the time, the sunlight doesn't even make it to the surface because of the clouds, but it is a much bigger effect that we're trapping that heat in. Imagine if you're cold, you get out a blanket and you um, keep your own body heat right next to you. But now imagine that you just keep adding blankets, so now maybe you're covered with a dozen blankets, and now it's the heat of summer, and it's 90 degrees outside, and you want to be able to get rid of some of this heat, and you can't, because these blankets are not easy to take off. It is not easy to get rid of greenhouse gases in the way that it is quite easy for our technologies to add them. There's a website that I really encourage you to click on um, to go through the animated version of this diagram, um, and it is, it is something that really is essential for us to understand as citizens, um, not huge to our curriculum goals, but, but really, really important to your everyday lives and your future. Now, it is so important for us to understand that there are long-term changes that the Earth goes through naturally. 
ups and downs of how much carbon is in the atmosphere, how much of this greenhouse gas is. But there are natural processes that could also remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it as limestone, coal, oil, and natural gas. As our technologies continue to use up coal and oil and natural gas, we are simply putting all that into the atmosphere and we don't have a way to bring it back out of the atmosphere. So this diagram um, at first shows us the locations of carbon. And we're not going to go into the details. This isn't an environmental science class. I, I do encourage you to consider taking an environmental science class if, if some of these topics are really um, sticking with you. But once we start to add the direction that carbon flows and how it flows, it gets, it gets quite busy as a diagram. But what I want us to recognize are the three arrows that are related to human activities. The burning of um, trees and wood, farming and getting carbon into the atmosphere that way, and then fossil fuel burning when we um, run our stoves or we heat our houses, things that we know that we need, we have been relying on a system that uses fossil fuels instead of some other form of electricity or energy. All of these put carbon into the atmosphere, uh, and this is just one of several greenhouse gases that we can track. It is important for us to recognize that the data is scary, but we cannot look away. We cannot afford to ignore this topic, and we can't afford to minimize it or um, hope that it's someone else's problem. It is all of our problems. The diagram here on the left is the carbon dioxide amount in parts per million over thousands and thousands of years. On the horizontal axis, it is showing thousands of years before current time. And ice core data shows us that there are um, there are these cycles, these long-term hundreds of thousands of years cycles, but that's not what we are seeing in the current data. Both ice core data and when it takes over in 1958 with modern instruments, we are seeing just a consistent increase in how much carbon dioxide we have because we just keep pumping it into the atmosphere with our technologies. On the right, we have a GIF that is repeating that is showing us 1958 to 2017, the most updated version of the GIF. Um, and there are, in some maps that you'll see, these kind of up and down um, from seasonal changes. And so the reason I like this circular GIF is it shows us, you know, when we compare January to January, the number's just increasing. When we're comparing May to May, the number is just increasing year by year. And it has continued to do so. Just because this GIF cuts off at 2017 doesn't mean that our increase in carbon dioxide has. And then the other topic that I want us to look at um, that is also becoming more of a mainstream news topic is the temperature change over time. So these two diagrams, both the left static plot and the right um, animated image, are showing us the global temperature change where the baseline is um, typically considered to be what was the average from 1850 to 1900. And on the left, we have, um, we can kind of see that the zero point is roughly in between the 1940 to 1970 range. But no matter what we are counting as zero, we can see that over the last several decades and continuing, the temperature has been increasing. And when we add the last uh, most recent years, uh, it has been increasing at a much faster rate. That change is accelerating, and it is something that we cannot ignore. This is something that I want you to understand and I want you to pay attention to, not because you're taking this class with me, but because you are existing in the world, that your future is tied to this information. And I want to be able to answer the questions that you have um, or talk with you about the questions that you have, because I might not have answers, uh, but I want you to feel safe to be able to talk about this stuff with me. And it is important for us to understand that this particular topic, climate change, is not actually key to our astronomy curriculum when you look at the learning objectives that we are required to cover in an astronomy class. But this is the most important topic that we will talk about relating to your personal individual futures. 
And so I do want to leave you with a couple of calls to action, and this is specific to you and your future and not to our course itself. I want you to stay informed about the environment. I want that to be something that is meaningful and important to you. Uh, and, you know, recognize how much you can take in, look for positive news um, to balance out with some of the scarier stuff, but pay attention. I also strongly encourage you to support policies that phase out fossil fuels. Uh, whether you can currently vote or whether you will soon be able to vote, I encourage you to register to vote, make sure your voice is heard, and pay attention to policies both at the national level but also at the local and state levels too. Your voice matters uh, and supporting policies is an easy step uh, even if you don't want to be part of a larger kind of activist approach. And the most important thing that I can tell you is that it is essential that you cultivate and maintain hope. I don't show you these things for you to get overwhelmed or for you to shut down because shutting down and deciding that it's not worth trying to fix is what the people in power want you to do. And hope is not an emotion. Hope is a call to action. Hope is a discipline, um, as Maryam Kaba so famously said. And it is really essential that you find ways that generate and maintain that hope. I strongly encourage you to listen um, to Amanda Gorman. Read her poem, Earthrise, or read it yourself. The text link is also available um, because it is a powerful way to balance the understanding that we have problems with the belief that we can solve these problems or address them. And I'll add um, this political cartoon um, that there are mixed feelings about, um, but in the end, the things that will help our environment are going to be positive policies overall. A lot of the pushback is because it's going to be hard to implement them or it's going to take away power from the people at the very top. And in the end, if we have a healthier earth, no matter whose fault climate change ends up being, a healthier earth is still worth fighting for, always. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.